four-time national champion, three-time motocross of nations champion. This is the Outside Gate with Steve Hall on the L4 Media Network, where we talk US moto and anywhere the conversation goes. I'm pumped to say that today we have Jeff Emig on the show. Jeff, how are you? Uh, I'm doing great, actually. Just uh, uh, just up here in uh, up here in uh, California, and just kind of winding my day down. Uh, been running around, uh, taking some suspension down to Enzo Racing. Got myself uh, another new uh, uh, 350 Husky from Mun Racing, and uh, looks like I'm going to be doing a little bit of racing again this year. So, yeah, just just doing what I do. Dude, I'm enormously grateful for your time today. I know you're uh, you're a, you're a busy man, and I, I I reckon there'd be a lot of uh, a lot of media outlets looking for your time. So I much appreciated. Um, so you're you're back getting back into Loretta's this year again. Yeah, it's looking like it. Um, you know, I really enjoyed uh, the process in 21, and then in 23. Um, and I thought maybe last year would be it. Uh, but then it's like, it's like on the Godfather, right? Every time you think you're out, then they, they pulls you back in type of deal. Um, I still really enjoy riding the motorcycle. Uh, I enjoy the challenge of it. And it's really good to get in bike shape, right? And <clears throat> also, you know, like I enjoy doing it, but just like before, it is part of my business. I mean, you know, I'm a part of We Big now. I'm a part of Viral Brand Goggles. Uh, everything I do with MX Locker and ODI and Rhino Power, Elevate, uh, you know, all of these brands that I that I represent. Um, there's a synergy to it all that the more active that I am on the motorcycle, the more engaged that I am uh, on the business side of things too. Right. Uh, and especially last year after I raced, uh, you know, after I raced uh, Loretta's, got a little bit lucky. Brown broke his bike. I ended up winning, you know, winning both of the vet titles there in the plus 40 and the plus 50. Um, and then I just, you know, I just took a ton of time off. I didn't really ride much. And I found that I just got a little bit disengaged with it. And so the more that I ride, uh, the more engaged I am with business and the more fit I get, the more focused I get, just I sleep better. It's just, uh, it really, let's see. So I'm 53. So I'm on, I've been riding for 48 years and it is just a big part of me. And when I get off the bike and I'm, I find that I'm not just as focused with a lot of things like riding the motorcycle is something that's very grounding for me and kind of, kind of gives me focus in a direction. It does, man. It's good for the soul. Hey. Yeah, uh, for sure. For sure. It's great. It's great stress relief. <laughs> it sure is. It sure. I hadn't been for a ride for a while. I, um, I blew up my old bike and I, uh, and I didn't have time to rebuild it. And then I, so I, I bought another one and finally got a chance to ride just last week. And that been the longest break of oh, my great. riding, longest break of my riding for for years, I think. You know, because I I've just been so busy, particularly doing this stuff, and you know, I, I have a construction business, and and I'm putting huge hours into the the podcast and the the media stuff, and um, and that sort of thing. And I, my poor old uh, Kawasaki is still sitting there with a blown up motor, and so yeah, I bought a. Um, I bought a YZ two fifty F and uh, and yeah yeah took it for its first ride there just uh, yeah just last week and so that was and I just you know loading up on the trailer to come home and that it just felt like it, everything's right in the world again because I've been out for a ride you know so yeah it is uh, it's good that's for a you. great that's a great way to put it yeah mm. yeah yeah um, before we get into your career man which is the main thing we want to talk about on this show. Just a, I might just grab a couple of thoughts on um, on season twenty four. Things have really um, things have really gotten spicy in the last few weeks with some of Jet's misfortune and 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 Coop Cooper Webb man, he's um, he's on fire. He's making it happen. So yeah, what's your thoughts on all of that? Yeah, I mean, obviously uh, Jet has shown that right now he's the newest greatest talent he seems to do things really easy 
And um, we've seen guys like that come, you know, through the ranks, you know, you know I mean, every decade there's somebody. Um, and so I don't really think of Cooper as, as being one of the old guys, but he's certainly a veteran. Like he certainly has got some experience to him. So it's an interesting sort of point where they're kind of coming together, right? Um, and you've got Tomac that has started to find his form here lately. Um, I think that it's really shaping up to be a, a fantastic, what was there going to be four <laughs> four races left in the, in the mm. championship. And I got to tell you, you know, last year Webb would have been in it in the title. I mean, he was in the title chase there until he knocked his head. Yes. But I mean, you, you, you know, you take that situation out and, you know, Tomac still has his, his misfortune. We'd be calling Cooper Webb the three time champion. That's right? right. But because yeah. he was so close again last year, uh, and, and, you know, missed out on that. Um, he came back with a tremendous amount of, uh, drive and, uh, you know, desire and determination. And so I think that, I think that it's going to be, I think it's going to go down to the end. Um, this is going to be as it should be, uh, Jet's greatest challenge in his career yet. You know, he mm. made it look pretty easy at times and he does come through the pack uh, fairly easy at times. And so do, so does, you know, Webb and, and some, you know, some of the other guys. Um, but the other contenders are not going to make it easy for any of them. You know, when you look at, at, um, where Chase Sexton is at with his riding and seems like he's starting to get things figured out with, uh, with the new team and bike that he's on there with KTM, uh, Anderson's kind of lingering right there still, you know, Anderson's certainly not going to let anybody buy to win a championship. He's going to, mm. you, you know, he may not be in the title chase, but if you're going to have to pass him, he, you know, just like he showed last week, like he ain't giving up. Yeah. So I think for our, our title contenders, it's one of those situations where it's just, they really do have to take it one race at a time, minimize any of the big, big mistakes, you know, try to, try to get, uh, best start as you can, you know, try not to um, do what Jet did last week where he put himself outside of the top 10 or something on the first lap. That's going to make it really difficult. So you're really just, you're focusing on a top five start, um, not making any mistakes. The, the interesting thing about last week to me was that Jet Lawrence won the heat race. He actually passed Cooper Webb. Mm. right and he sliced his way through the field um you know made his way up to what was it a fifth um but cooper webb had a fastest lap times mm. and then th there was somebody else that had a fast uh, i guess sexton probably would be so webb isn't necessarily the guy that at times you you would predict would have the fast lap time, you're going to predict yeah. that he's going to get a good start. He's going to like, you know, kind of mus muscle his way through, you know, grind his way through to a victory. So the fact that he's able to ride in a way that he sets the fast times, and I believe he qualified fastest. Yeah, qualified I didn't, I didn't fastest, want to qualify yeah. last week. I was, yes, he did. Was, yeah, uh, which is, that's very unusual for Coop. Yeah. So, you know, um, that's that to me is the most interesting you know fact in this whole or stat i should say in this whole scheme of things that happened last week because webb goes about it a different way and he doesn't really look like he was gonna set the fast time over jet because jet you know looks just beautiful on the bike it's so fluid and he just does these things that just you know jumps some sections that were you know, um, off from the other guys trying to make some new lines, but yet Webb ended up with the fast times. And I would think that um, Jet Lawrence and Honda have to be pretty worried about the the competition that they're facing there because Tomac, Anderson, uh, Sexton are not going to make it easy. And Webb 
is once again rising to the challenge of the Monster Energy Supercross title. Mm. And that's going to be, um, Webb is, he's, he's a guy that when it's championship time, he usually steps up and he gets it done. And, it, you know, you don't, you don't have to look that far back. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the, uh, which year was it? Uh, shoot. I can't remember the years now, but where, um, Roxon and Webb are going at it there. And in the last yeah. race, Webb just completely annihilated the competition. He didn't even uh, have to win. And he just went out. That was, 20, and just, it was 21. Just, yeah. 21. 20, 21. Okay, yeah. Yeah. And then 22 would have been Tomac went in the championship. 23 would have been sex. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for getting the stat, stats straight. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that, and that's, that's who Jet Lawrence is racing. That's, mm. that's the competition that he has. But like I'm saying is it's not just Cooper Webb. It's, yeah. There are three or four other riders that can race either one of them extremely hard. So, you know, it's like I, I, I mentioned, I said it last week, uh, I was on a show and, and it's like, um, you ever hear these stories about these climbers that go to Mount Everest? Well, at the very end t towards the top of the climb is Hillary's step, right? It's the last little bit. And it's like, you know, you've already been, you know, trying to acclimatize for months to, you know, you got to go up and down, up and down, up and down, and you're working your way yeah. up and then you get almost to the top and then you got to do Hillary's step. And it's just, you know, at that point, where are you at? 20, 28,050 feet, maybe, I think it is. This is a crazy, crazy numbers, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and so, once again, if you want to be Supercross champion, you want to be on the top there and have the grand prize and all of dirt bike racing, um, you're going to – these last this last month is going to be like hitting Hillary's step for, for both those guys. Yeah, yeah. It's fantastic. Like, I, um, I'm, I'm torn – I'm torn and sometimes I say I'm a bad Aussie because I want, I want the battle. I didn't want jet to tear away with this thing. And when it's all said yeah. and done, when it's all said and done, I do want jet to win it. Um, but I want him to win it on the, the, the one it to go down to Salt Lake city and battling to the last lap to the last corner. Like I, I want the, I want the good race, you know, that's it. Cause I, you know, I'm a, yeah. I'm a proud Aussie, but, but even more so, I think I'm a, a huge fan of the sport. So I really want to see that, um, the battle. Yeah. Yeah. It's shaping yeah, up. I mean, if you don't have a dog in the fight, what you, you're, what you're looking for is just a great battle. That's interesting. That's not predictable. You know, you don't want one of the guys to get taken out by a lap rider or have a wheel blow out mm. or engine break or, you know, something, something funky. We want to see these guys duke it out. And to be honest, I want to see Sexton and Tomac and these guys all play a part in it also. Sorry, my dog, he's got a deer <laughs> antler that he's playing with and he just That's has no God. respect for the fact that we're on, that we're on a, on a what's podcast. The, what's here, the dog so. called? What's your dog called? Dog. Th this one's Butters. I got two dogs. I got Elvis, which is a little brown and white, uh, King Charles Cavalier Spaniel. You know, he's like 11 years old. It's, he's a little, just a yeah. little lap dog. Uh, and then Butters is a big uh, German Shepherd, Great Pyrenees mix. So he's like a real tall German Shepherd. Um, just he's a very he's a very canine looking dog. Like yeah, yeah, yeah he's he's great. But cool. I don't mind a bit of dogs noise in the, the background. I, I love animals, man. So yeah, my my dog yeah. will be sitting just the other side of the studio door there, just waiting for me. So yeah, yeah, cool, yeah. Jeff, what's your thoughts on um, on yeah? So we've got a we've got a two fifty uh, two fifty East West showdown coming. Who you got for that? What's your thoughts there? Well, I think that it's once again. I think it's a it's an interesting season, and you, you, you know, it's really unfortunate to see Austin Forkner get hurt like he did, yes. have that issue. I mean, I I I literally have no words other than mm. you know, um, I hope that he's feeling better and and yeah. uh that he is uh, recovering um but starting his career with so much hope and optimism and and he, he's just been littered with so many 
injury crashes and then you know subsequently subsequently uh, getting injured um and that's mm. that's rough that's that takes its toll on the head and the heart along with the body. So, yeah. um, I, I, I don't, um, you know, I think Levi kitchen has figured something out. We have mm. a little connection running the number 47. Uh, you know, his amateur number is 47 and all that mm. stuff. And, 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 um, so, uh, you know, he actually DM me the other day and he was like, Hey, why do you run the number 47? And so I told him, you know, kind of, here's the deal. And I just that day, um, my girlfriend, Jessica, um, had thought about the number 47 and did some, you know, goes on the internet researching about the number 47. So it literally was the same day talking about the world working in uh, mysterious ways. Mm. And it was like, well, why, how did you end up with 47? He goes, well, Ricky Carmichael and James Stewart were my two favorite riders. So I took the four and the seven and put it together. I said, well, that, that, that works for me. But I, I think Levi Kitchen has got something figured out. And I think that what, um, um, I, I think that you're going to see a Deegan Kitchen clash sometime soon. Mm. Um, a lot of good riders in there. A lot of, a lot of kids, I call them kids, they're young men. Uh, a lot of young men that have a lot to prove. Um, if I'm McAdoo, I'm just staying out of any trouble with anyone. I'm just trying to get good starts and just keep the blinders on and mind my own business. Where mm. Deegan's in a position where he needs to make up some points and he's going to be out there doing what he does, you know, uh, just creating havoc. And I think that Kitchen right now is maybe the most focused um, and, and really has the speed. So there's, there's all these different facets to this, uh, to this championship, you know, when you put in the West coast guys and the East coast guys and mix them together. I mean, I got to do that in my day. We used to run three a year. Mm. Um, and there's, a you know, there's a little bit of ego on the line, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. The West is the best and, you know, the, 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 all this sort of stuff, you know, we like to tease about it. So kind of a, you know, a little storyline that lives under underneath there. And you want to, you want to go out and, um, you know, perform the best that you can. Yeah. But when you they, think yeah. about the age, the age that these young men are at, um, they've got a lot of ego, a lot of pride. Mm. They're out there trying to get their piece, show that they're the best and, that just always makes for great racing. They got to balance that ego with, especially the guys in the total fight are really got to balance that ego as, as far as, you know, um, you know, yeah. how far they, how far they want to push it. Do they want to, you know, do they want to be king shit and win the whole thing or do they want to collect points, you know? So it's, um, it's always interesting. I think, yeah, I, and I feel agree. like Deegan's yeah. the kid. Uh, yeah. I feel like Deegan's the kid that's out there. That's like, he doesn't care who it is, nothing yeah. championship. He's just, he's going to just go for broke. And if anybody's in his way, he's going to mow him down if, if he has to, you know, and so the, you know, he's a certain personality, you know, he's certainly Brian Deegan's son. Um, <laughs> and uh, they had that, that brings a certain amount of confidence and, and determination and things like that. So, mm. Um, it's it, it, it's going to be interesting. It is. It is. Cool. Jeff, we might get into talking a little bit about your career now. Um, yeah. The the first question I always ask, and, and I think it's my favorite question, is just uh, about when the when the bug first bit for to the you know your first um, time you saw saw mini bikes or rode one and and that and you first just really got uh, bitten by that bug that was like this is what I want to do for my life I love these things man that's a good question uh, I'm actually in the process of writing a book with a with a writer of course uh, and so I revisited some of those uh, some of those memories mm. and talking about um this would have been early 70s right i was born late 1970 my dad and his buddies my dad was a race car builder and when motorcycles dirt bikes really got popular 
in the United States in the late or in the early 70s, him and his buddies had had all these motorcycles. And they'd go, we'd go on camping trips and ride in the woods and back in the Midwest where I grew up in Kansas and Missouri, some of the best like single track off-road riding, just glorious, just awesome creeks and rocks and trees and, you know, small mountains and, and just camping and doing that whole thing. You know, there'd be four or five motorhomes and all the families and everybody riding. And um, I think that, that the first, the first the first element is that I grew up with a speech impediment and I've stuttered my entire life but when I was a little kid I stuttered really bad I stutter at times now people probably just think of it as my speech pattern and they don't really think much of it I know when it happens sometimes Mm -hmm. people may know sometimes they I may just be searching for a thought but when I was little I, I I didn't speak very well and I think that once my dad put me on the gas tank of the motorcycle and had me hold on to the handlebars, right? So you're holding on to steel handlebars, right? Mm. There were no bar pads and stuff really back then. Got my nuts setting on a steel gas tank, right? And he's revving up this, uh, you know, Yamaha 360 or whatever. It would have been this two stroke. The thing was probably Mm. vibrating like shit, you know, like just crazy. And my dad's taken off and riding me around on this motorcycle. And that was probably the first time that I felt the vibration that excites us all about getting on a, on a, on a motorcycle, on a dirt bike. And that if you haven't ever done that, you don't know what that feeling is. It's like, it's like surfing. If you never surf and you catch that wave and you slide down and everything you know, starts to get quiet there. Like, you know, only a surfer knows the feeling. You can't tell somebody. You can read a book, but you don't know the feeling. Hmm. So my dad putting me on the motorcycle and riding me up these hills and just the, 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 how violent I'm sure it felt at three and a half years old, holding on to the handlebars and, you know, doing all this and the excitement and the thrill of it. That's, that's when I'm like, okay, you know, that's, you know, where's my motorcycle? And as my older brother, Brian, who's a couple years older, mm. so he got older, he got a new bike. And then my dad told the story when I was little that it's like, okay, well, you can't ride. Uh, we had a little Indian 50. I think he had a yellow tank, red, like pinstripe on it. Um, comparable to what a JR 50 or a PW 50, something like that would be. Yeah is, uh, well, you can't ride the motorcycle until you can ride your bicycle without training wheels. And as the story goes, my dad said, he said that, and, my, and I was like, take training wheels off. Let's go, take them off, grab the crescent wrench, let's do this, right? So whatever it took, whatever I have to do to, to be able to ride that thing, that's, that's what I wanna do. And my first ride, I believe, was uh, at a baseball field, like at a park, you know, like a, mm. like a city park, yeah. Uh, riding around the baseball field in the in the grass. The baseball field's still there, actually. So, mm. yeah. <laughs> I love it. I love and that story. Just, love it. Yeah, and and uh, even though I don't remember specific things from 1975 like that, mm. just knowing that the sort of isolation that you can have by riding a motorcycle where you get on the motorcycle and it's you and point it wherever you want to go. And that's, what's great about riding, um, um, off road bikes is that, you know, you, other than sort of staying in a general area, you point the front wheel to where you want to go. We're on the street, you kind of got to stay on the streets and that's mm-hmm. it. But you want to go up this hill or go down here or over this or whatever you can, you can do that. And so, Riding a, a a motorcycle was my way of getting away from from you know having to talk to people, <laughs> probably, you know, mm. because mm. talking wasn't my wasn't my my greatest talent at the time. Now it is though. Yeah, I um I've heard you speak about about this before, and um actually, uh, I, I I um. Uh, a video that i've watched several times i watch a lot of old races on youtube and uh mostly yeah. because 
I, I, I'm actually still finding races. I'm a huge lifetime fan, but we never got US races on television. So yeah, I'm still finding things I haven't yet seen. I'll find ones I've, I've never seen this one before. So it's pretty yeah. cool in that, in that respect. But one that always pops up, uh, probably because I've watched a lot of times. Of, uh, it's an old, um, it's a, uh, what was the, the uh the californian series cnc cnc i think cnc series yeah the golden state championship golden state series that's it and you it was was amazing yeah you won the 80s race and you're on there um on the 80s race and and interviewing and um and that sort of thing you and i think even um is bud i think bud man's in the race and yeah there's quite a few quite a few people i think it was a 250 cc and 80 cc round or something like that that comes up which is pretty cool and yeah. and you can notice your your interview you can sort of notice a bit what you say about your speech and i've heard you talk about it before and then to end up being a um a, the voice of the sport announcing the races is a pretty um it's an amazing thing you know and um well you, i've always said that people people ask me all the time like oh you know what what do you think your greatest accomplishment's been you know going down that sort of road and I said, look, I'm not, I don't want to discount what I was able to accomplish um, on the motorcycle with the support of my family and my dad and dedication from, you know, race teams and mechanics and people around me and all that. And what we, we achieved, yes, I'm the guy on the bike, but there are a lot of pieces of the puzzle. But I honestly think that going from where I I was with my speech, especially when I was a kid and as a professional racer, watching some of the interviews that I gave that were just horrendous. It's so cringy for me now to, to sort of, um, you know, face my fears, I think would be a good way to put it and Mm. to find a way to overcome my fears and find a voice and to represent an entire industry globally right Mm -hmm. worldwide broadcast whether it's um you know pro motocross supercross motocross of nations most recently world supercross Mm -hmm. arena cross championships podcast you know you name it Mm -hmm. and i still criticize i still critique myself quite a bit these days but i think the that my greatest accomplishment has been the ability to um, overcome the hurdle that I've had with my speech and turn that into, um, you know, a career in broadcasting. And hopefully I'll get the opportunity to do Supercross and and, and uh, those types of championships again, um, because I really enjoy the work and I mm. take it seriously. Uh, we try to have fun with the broadcast, right? It's not like we're curing cancer or anything here. We're just calling dirt bike races, but you, you know, you, you just want to give your very best effort, right? Your best, uh, mm. you know, your best uh, performance. Um, and so that's kind of, you know, how I, how I look at that. And w- there was an interesting situation. Um, oh man. Let's see. Ricky retired in 2008 or 2007. Seven. Yeah. I think he was inducted in the Motorcycle Hall of Fame here in America the next mm. year. And that same year, two um, um, gentlemen were uh, uh, inducted into the Motorcycle Hall of Fame again, but as a as a legendary, like a separate sort of yeah. level. The next level, uh, yeah, and that was legend Torsten, status. I Torsten think it is, Hallman. Yeah. That that same night, they gave this special honor to Torsten Hallman, who, of course, I rode for Hallman Racing and Thor and knew Torsten. Have known Torsten since 1987, mm. um, and his his accomplishments to the sport after his legendary racing career, and then also Mark Blackwell, who um, was a championship racer. Um, then went into business, applied his, his next career in the motorcycling industry with, um, 
you know, multiple groups, you know, like KTM group and uh, Polaris and, and he's and a super like interesting and, guy, Mark Blackwell, super interesting guy. Yeah. Great yeah, story. Yeah. And, and I actually, then Mark and I, our paths crossed when we, the early discussions for the United States motorcycle coaching association, motorcycle coaching association, and which now is also motorcycle coaching.org. Mm. So then I got to work for years, work side by side with Mark and, and become friends with Mark and see how he does business and, and, and all these things. So you, when I retired at age 29 in the year 2000 with the back mm. injury, leg injury, wrist injuries, right before that, you think, okay, that's it. I'm retired. And it's like, Whoa, you know, there's still a lot more life and a lot more to accomplish. And um, I started a family very quickly, started having kids, was married. And then this sort of fear of complacency sets in like, oh, shit, what am I going to do? Mm. And this whole time after I retired, I did a little stint with the broadcast in 2002, it was, and it didn't go well. I wasn't in the right position. I wanted the color analyst position, which at the time David Bailey had. Yeah. So it just didn't work out. And then in 2006, the opportunity came around again to do to join the broadcast uh, with a Monster Energy Supercross or, you know, AMA Supercross, whatever it was at the time, THQ or EA Sports or who knows, you know. Yeah. yeah. And and so that's when I looked at, OK, there's this idea of a second career. And that I always talk about my sort of fictitious goal with my broadcasting was to try to be the best color analyst broadcaster that the sport had ever seen so that maybe one day the, the, um, um, the Motorcycle Hall of Fame would then recognize me again, just like they did with Torsten and Mark. Yeah. And I know that that's kind of fictitious, but it's a way to set this long-term goal and this, yes. like your like your waypoint that you work towards instead of just being out there in the ether floating around is going, mm. okay, I want to be the best broadcaster the sport's ever seen. Um, and right now uh, I'm on the sidelines and I don't have a, a championship. I don't have any, any races to broadcast and to uh, work on that on that goal. But I did Supercross for, what was it, 12, 12 seasons, you know, mm. motocross for a lot of those, uh, motocross some nations with Paul Malin and some GP broadcast, um, World Supercross, a little stint with that deal the last couple of years and, yeah. and um, you know, bits and bobs. So I enjoy this part of it and it keeps you – uh, current and it keeps you conscious of what you're saying and what you're thinking, where you're crafting your thoughts. And so how do I think about this situation versus that? And certainly at age 53, mm. I don't know how, how, old, how old you are. 48. 48. Okay. Yeah. So I got, so I got five years on you, yeah. but yeah, but you know, think about how much different you think about things at age 48 than you would 18 or even 28. Right. So you have this wisdom and then you try to apply this. And I love, um, I watch a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of uh, political stuff. I have my, my favorites that I like to watch for certain reasons. And I really love to watch how my favorite people, my favorite personalities do, you know, how they do interviews and how they process the information that comes with the interview. Mm. And um, I, um, I've got some ideas that I'm working on right now. Um, um, ha haven't got anything concrete yet set in stone, but there's probably the option of doing another podcast or, or a show. I really have some ideas for some new video content that wouldn't yeah. necessarily be, you wouldn't classify it as podcast, but it would be video content and, the idea of doing one-on-one -on -one interviews in that format is something that I'm interested in also, but mm. there's just nothing like the thrill of doing the live racing broadcast. You yeah. Know? 
as a fan, I certainly I miss of... hearing. I certainly yeah. miss hearing from you. Like, I oh, I really loved the um the four four seven podcast that you and Ricky did for yeah. a while and that sort of thing. And we're getting to hear from you and uh, that yeah. sort of thing. So yeah, uh, I think where the sport has been missing missing the uh, missing Fro's voice a little bit in recent times. So, well, I appreciate it. I I you know I hope that people understand that. You know, my enthusiasm and my excitement, whether it's on on our podcast or on a racing broadcast, is really authentic. And I think that that's why when I mean, I don't go anywhere. I don't go anywhere. Any races, certainly without a somebody's talking about Fitness no Smooth, right? The movie or <laughs> people going, oh, man, loved you and Ralph on the broadcast. And Ralph's still one of my best buddies. I mean, we literally text like daily along with yep. uh, th- this guy, Pete Richards, who was the Supercross Research Department. So we're constantly talking about current events, like literally daily. I probably have text messages. Yeah, I got a text message. Top of my text message right now, mm. Ralph and Pete. And what that that process is that we do when we're talking about sporting events, or we try not to talk politics, but talking about sporting events and certain things is it it increases your intelligence level of how to think about um, certain situations that happen, and then I apply it to you know I apply it to motocross and supercross, right? Um, and there's certainly a lot of sporty you know sporting events and scenarios things that happen that, um, you know, if you have the right team around you, you know, to talk through these things, come to a good conclusion and a good output of like, okay, here's, here's what I think about it. And what was great is great about my partnership with Ralph. He's still with us. He's, he hasn't gone anywhere. Um, we're just not doing any races right now is that Ralph and I have developed just such a great chemistry. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And our humor, where I'm a real smart ass and I can, I mean, I can, I can get out there. Ralph is so grounded and such a, he has such a good heart, right? And I'm like the smart ass kid, but he's the, like, <laughs> the one. So he, he likes to have fun, but he yeah. knows how far to take the humor and wins yeah. the right, the right level of sarcasm or humor. Or if, you know, you're going to have some, some little thing that makes it interesting and fun. Um, but not go too far. I'm the guy that can like go off in the weeds on something. And then when it comes to the racing broadcast, Ralph and I, we just have that chemistry, that back and forth working together for so long um, that it's just a blast to work with. You know, he really is. And when we got the opportunity uh, a few couple of years ago, I should say with Supercross Global, to help them build the new world supercross championship you know we jumped on it and ralph and i along with Kristen b who's uh one of our dear friends and we just love her to death love working with her um we were a really good team you know and we were thinking hey here's this new opportunity that we mm-hmm. have to to be involved in these supercross races globally uh unfortunately the wheels came off it for us and some things contractually yeah uh, went the wrong way and we're out um but we were really looking forward to working together then yeah yeah obviously you know world supercross is a is a struggling thing all up isn't it so there's yeah i'm not gonna i'm not gonna dig into that that's not the type of uh interviews i do but yeah, yeah. cool cool um oh yeah uh, i've got to ask you uh for some thoughts and some memories about manji Muff. Um, so yeah, cool. 1992, uh, the, inf- the infamous B team, uh, the motocross of nations that, uh, manage him up in, uh, in Western Australia, which is a long way from me. I've never been there. So yeah, it's a complete other side of the country. It's on the me. other side of the world for me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah Actually, yeah. I still have one last blister that I'm trying to recover from, from that race. <laughs> That's literally what I remember is how in the bottom it's all sandy but then you go up the sides of the hills and there's all these really gnarly square edge bumps and i just yeah. remember the square edge bumps and then in the bottom these shoes just sand rollers 
So you couldn't really set the bike up or anything. And you just mm. had a, you know, you had one big gate, 125s, you know, doesn't matter which start it was, you're going to be in the back of the pack. You're just pulling tear offs and trying to go past guys on a bike that's like highly, highly underpowered. Um, it was, it was a difficult race for me because I fell in uh, practice and I, and I strained this ligament in my thumb. And I was like, I don't, I don't think I'm going to be able to race. And Brian Luna's legendary mechanic was actually down there yeah. working for me that, that one race okay uh, yeah um we're in the box we're in this like you know cargo van and i get done with practice and i come in i said oh brian my thumb and he literally like slaps me in the face and says shut the fuck up don't say anything to anyone about this you get on that bike and you ride it and you'll deal with it later and i'm like thinking well shit he slapped me right it was, I was 20 years old. Here's this legendary guy. I'm like, okay. Yeah. And I was literally, I, 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 I went to the line for the first moto and I'm like, I, I don't think I can hang. I can't hang on to the grip. And then the gate drop and you do it and you get through the braces and it was done. And I was like, wow. Okay. I guess, I guess I could do it. You know? So <laughs> Do you remember it made um, it a little bit harder after the race hold on to the big VB or something after big cold yeah. VB, but I iced my iced my thumb down. After That'd be icing, icing it at the same time. Yeah. Do you remember getting the call right. up for it? Like, did you expect, you know, did you have, before you got the call up for that first nations, did you, did you expect it all to get asked to go? Well, I just knew that Michael Rocco and I were, at the top of our game that year, we were racing for the 125 AMA motocross championship. Yeah. And then Bradshaw had gotten hurt uh, with the knee injury at Red Bud. Stanton and those guys felt like they, Stanton and Kudrowski and some of those guys, they, they had just squeaked up by a couple of wins and they kind of went, it was in this place where all the, the, the normal, the guys that should have gone, yeah. like they didn't want to go. They didn't want to go. I think yeah. Stanton's even said that he's kind of regretful that he didn't go. Certainly yeah. would have been a great choice to go ride the 500, um, yeah. you know, because he had experience on that. Fortunately, yeah. they they made the decision to bring Billy Lyles over from Europe, riding yeah. the Grand Prix circuit on a 500, racing these mm. guys weekly. Yeah. Uh, put Michael Rocco on a 250, which was great. He had rode, rode some 250 Supercross, certainly mm. was in great form. Kawasaki had a good 250 bike. Mm. Um, um, and then I was on like on a total hot streak. So about the time that it was time to make the picks, I, I didn't think that there was any reason why they wouldn't pick me to be on the team. Yeah, and I, yeah. and I, I, I mean, I, I felt especially – around that time of year in August, late August, that I was the best 125 rider in the world. And that's why I went to the race looking forward to racing Stefan Everts, right? He and yeah. I, we were like fire and ice back in those days. We're buddies now. Uh, <laughs> love the guy. Love the guy. Uh, but, you know, you're racing. You both are going for the same thing. Um, we had that great clash. We went down together in the first moto and all this sort of stuff. Unfortunately, he got a flat the one race. So we never really got to see how it, how it would play out that that week, you know, or that that mm. day. But yeah, I was totally looking forward to like I'm going to be the first 125 rider. That that's all I'm. That's all that's all that mattered to me, right? Mm. And if you look at where our results were in comparison to the other bikes. I think we were fourth, fifth, sixth, somewhere in there each moto mm. on the 125s, right? So yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I believe. What was your uh, bike like? Was the bike Everton good? After I went down, my, yeah. my bike was the bike good. Yeah, yeah, the production bike was the worst, one of the worst ever made. But but the race bike was great in '92. Yeah. The, the race bike was un unbelievable. Yeah, yeah, we yeah, did so a lot did of work you, on it to make it. Did you bring a motor? Did you brought a motor? You brought an engine from? Oh yeah, the, from the oh yeah, the whole thing. Yeah. yeah, oh yeah, you brought the whole thing. Yeah. Oh yeah, but yeah, yeah. you know, you gotta remember is that. The outside of the U.S., uh, there were uh, really strict uh, rules on the type of fuel you could run. 
So you take the lead out of the fuel, then all of a sudden you got detonation and your, your jetting's off and the bike doesn't run the same. And, you know, the smaller the piston, the more temperamental it gets with things like that. So mm -hmm. you have to go through all of the extra testing and everything to try to, um, to try to make the bike run right. And it never runs as good as it does at home because of the fuels that we were allowed to use. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and what people don't remember is our championship in America wasn't finished yet. We still had two pro motocross events after that. So yeah. it was like, okay, season's over. Now we can just focus on this. Michael Rocco and I were in a like crazy battle for the 125 <laughs> yeah. title. And then we yeah. had to be teammates. Yeah. And Mike's not a very talkative guy to begin with, especially <laughs> then. Yeah. I'm actually friends with Mike now. Our son, yeah. we, we both have sons named Jagger that go to the same school that are about six months apart, born about six months apart. And they're friends. His <laughs> son has stayed at my, my yeah. Morocco's kid has stayed at my house before. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. Isn't it? Yeah. Sweetest kid, sweetest kid. I'm like, you're nothing like your dad, you know? <laughs> um, yeah. But Mike and I get on great. But during that time period, we were not good. And so mm. here we are, you know, they put us together to do photos, all of us and, and all this. And, and I remember we were riding in one of the vans, uh, home from the race that day that Sunday afternoon and we we're riding back to this like resort that we were staying at and Mike kind of looks over at Lee looks over and goes man we were to kick their ass today and I'm like thinking what like are you talking to me you know so because he we we didn't really speak much but on that day uh, along with Billy and the rest of the team members and everybody we were able to uh, come away with a, a victory and uh, bring the Chamberlain Trophy back to America for at least another year. So it was a really special race, but I just remember it being really difficult. I remember it just at the time, that was the hardest race, the most pressure that I had ever faced. And there's just no feeling like standing on top of the victory podium and the three of us, along with Roy Jansen, the team manager, we're holding the Chamberlain trophy, right? That big cup and they play your national anthem. And it's like, man, the emotion comes out. You're just like, you know, we don't have to go fight any wars. Thankfully, like the soldiers and the veterans do. Uh, mm. This is our war that we fight for our country in our little yeah. way, you know, our little, I'm not trying to compare the two. I'm just saying that, yeah. that, um, you know, this is this is the war that we fight on the motocross battlefield, if you will. What's your what's your favorite like singular race of your career? That's that's probably a hard one, or maybe it's one you've thought of already. But just your Ooh. favorite one race. Favorite single race? Wow, man, that is a that is actually a pretty tough question. Nobody's ever asked me that single race. Um. Man, you know, I, I would have to think that because of the circumstances, um, my my that I got out of it would have been Steel City in 1996, where Jeremy McGrath and I were uh, almost tied in points. I think I had a one point yeah. two point lead going into the final race. Mm. Um, what was on the line? knowing that Jeremy had just came back from his, his injury. He had won Binghamton, both motos the week before mm. steel city. He said was his favorite track, right? Uh, there's that famous interview with Davey Coombs from the week before we interviews, Jeremy, all oh, steel city is my favorite place. And then he interviews me right after. And he says, uh, Oh, we just, you know, talked to Jeremy and he said, uh, Steel City is his favorite track, you know, can't wait for next week or whatever. And I, who just got second in both motos, I say, well, we'll see whose favorite track it is next week. You know, and it's like, <laughs> you know, you look back, you go, whoa, where was I at mentally? <laughs> like, yeah. where was I at where I'm like, okay, he might have won both races this weekend, but next week is going to be a different story. And it's such a great place to be in as a racer. Like, 
to be in that moment. We are so fortunate, win or lose, that you, one, have an adversary that you end up focusing so much on and that your whole life just gets focused down just like there's nothing but that that you're that even exists and then to be able to go to steel city um and to be victorious that day was really really just a a a special moment in my life and in my career and what people people unless you were there or you've heard me talk about it on a show uh people don't realize that the day didn't start out that good for me like i was pretty Mm -hmm. nervous uh, compared to the confidence I had seven days before that, <laughs> where I, yeah. you know what I mean? So in practice, I don't remember his first practice, second practice was race day morning. I'm chasing the grass around and we come out of this turn where you would go into the grass section, what they called the pro section. And I come out of this turn and I start wheeling and I can't shut off the throttle and I loop out and I break yeah. the rear fender off. I've heard this one before, yeah. Have you, have you <laughs> yeah. heard this? Yeah. I have, yeah, yeah. So then, yeah. and practice was almost over, so I just rode across the middle of the track into the pit area. Like, you know, the walk of shame, the ride of shame, no rear fender. Like, you're supposed to be the greatest day ever. I'm. This is what I'm supposed to be the most focused, and I just do something stupid like that and break off my rear fender. And my mechanic, Jeremy Albrecht, says I came in and said, oh, yeah, the throttle stuck. Something happened to the throttle. Throttle stuck. So they changed the throttle tube, the throttle cable. They take the carburetor apart, clean everything, make sure make sure everything's right. They do all this extra work. Of course, put a new rear fender on. Um, and he said that later on, after we had won the championship that day, that we were sitting in the truck and I admitted that the throttle didn't really stick. I was just embarrassed about it or something. I don't remember that, but... It's certainly a, um, um, a, a, you know, a situation that could have happened. Yeah. Fantastic. You know? Jeff, Jeff, who was your favorite teammate? Um, I really, when my first year as a pro rider or as a factory, my first full year as a pro, I was on factory Kawasaki. So I had Jeff Ward, Johnny mm. O'Mara, Jeff Mantasevich. I was low man on the totem pole. I was uh, riding one to five supercross, one to five outdoors. And Johnny O'Mara was at the end of his career. He actually retired yeah, that season. His last, last year. But, yeah. yeah. We used to travel with him quite a bit. He would fly into the same airport. Um, and there was a bunch of us young guys like Buddy Antonez, myself. And so we would end up, you know, spending a little bit of time with Johnny O. And he was probably in the right place to – not that he ever coached me or trained me like officially, but you could tell that he had a real mentoring uh, way about him where Jeff Ward was focused. I'm going from here. I'm going car racing. Like, okay, boom, I'm out. Jeff Mantasevich was, he was chicken, right? A lot of, a lot of chaos happening, but (laughs) Johnny O was a really good leader in that way. Now we know that since he retired in 1990, look how many riders he has mm. coached and mentored since then. Some of yep. the greatest of champions. Yep. And so maybe that was the being a teammate with Johnny O was the, the, his first um, opportunity to, to have that sort of effect on somebody's, uh, you know, on somebody's uh, career or life. But I just remember um, we used to fly into, we used to fly back from like pro motocross races after the race. After the race was over, we'd go to the airport and catch the last flight back into Ontario Airport. It's in the LA area, not LAX, but Ontario, so it's a small airport. And back in the days before they had digital headphone stuff or any of that didn't exist, um, they would play music in the airplane. But do you remember the little headphones that you had, but they were like an air tube? They were like two tubes. You remember those at all? And you'd no. plug the tube in and the sound would come through these tubes. Well, you could put these things on and you would talk into it. And Johnny O would, he would 
he would you'd have the headphones on you know, maybe you're sleeping or something it's a late flight and he'd pull the things out and he'd be like this is your captain speaking uh we'll be landing soon and and it sounded like the captain was speaking but then you realize it's johnny o on the johnny o on the headphones so you know I, I was really lucky to have a lot of great teammates um couple that i just didn't jibe with and that's that's gonna happen right mm. i mean so i went from um Metasivis, Johnny O'Mara, Jeff Ward. Um, the next year I went to Yamaha. So it was Damon Bradshaw, Doug Dubach for a couple of years. Uh, Dubach's gone. Bradshaw's gone. Mike Craig comes in. That was a difficult year. Um, then the next year, Yamaha retools. And it's, um, would it have been uh, John Dowd maybe? Well, let's see, 93. Yeah, 94 would have been Craig. 95, Bradshaw comes back for a little bit. John Dowd, uh, Kevin Windham, I believe, would have been on the team. Then the next year, I go to Kawasaki, and it's uh, Ryan Hughes, Damon Huff, and myself for a couple of years. Um, had a great time with both those guys. Um, then Hughes is out in 99. Uh, Carmichael comes in. So, yeah. So... That was, awesome. that was the, that's the list of teammates. And of awesome. course, Ricky, you know, Ricky and I are still really good friends this day. He was in a much different place at that time than where he's at now. And, and, um, but yeah, we had, we, I mean, for the most part, I feel like I had pretty, pretty good teammates. Cool. Jeff, it's time for this for a quick ad read. So uh, the here at the outside gate, we're sponsored by Guts Racing uh, in 1990, Jamie Gregg. Andy's dad, he fired up, uh, fired up Greg's Ultra Trick seats, and uh, what I've been saying is it's it's lucky that um, that he was an American and come up with that Ultra Trick name because imagine if imagine what they would have been called if he was an Australian if it was founded in Australia they'd be like Greg's bloody ripping seats or Greg's Greg's yeah, feed yeah. Greg's feed income seats and not, like they wouldn't have, just wouldn't have sounded right would it so. Lucky you come up with the gut seats. I've got a I've got a new gut seat on my way for my uh, for my Yamaha. And uh, I was last episode I spoke about the website. The website is fantastic, gutsracing.com. It's really easy, uh, really easy to remember, really easy to use once you're in there. You can go in, you can pick the your colours for the side, for the top, for the stripes, you can add ballistic material to the sides if you are uh, tearing things up with your knee braces. Uh, yeah. ultralight foams, different heights, uh, you name it. Really, really easy to use. When you get the seat and uh, or the uh, or the seat cover, it comes with like QR code instructions, which is just amazing. It shows you if you've never fitted a seat cover before, it comes with instructions that'll show you how to do it yourself. Um, amazing. Been used by, um, you know, obviously uh, heaps of the, the top teams, um, Rockstar Husky, um, Hep Suzuki, uh, Club MX, uh, Phil, everyone's favorite rider. Phil's just announced this is going to be his last year. His last, and he's on. Uh, he's out there on the gut seats. Even even my old ass sits on one. So um, yeah, just again, yeah. yeah so, uh, Gutracing so com. Brand. Yeah, yeah. It definitely, definitely. Here, lots of great things. I've been riding for the last week here in California. Um, a 2024 Rockstar Edition Husky 450, which actually has a gut seat on it. Yep. Um, and yeah, great, great, really good, really good. So I appreciate them sponsoring the show. No worries, that's good. Good to hear. Good to hear that you've been riding on a gut seat. Yeah, well done. So and yeah, yeah so I just got me got lined more. up though. Yeah, yep, I just got me lined up a couple of new. Uh, a couple of FC three. I'm gonna ride an FC 350 Husky for Mun Racing out of Texas. They're a, a big racing dealer in Texas KTM Group. Yep. Um, so been uh, setting setting up some new bikes. Yep. Very good. Getting geared up. Getting geared up for uh, for the Redders. Um, Jeff, I might mm -hmm. just I just have a couple of uh, uh, I've I've taken an area of time, but I just have a couple of um, oddball questions I like to to ask towards the end of the show. Um, there's some sort of some fun stuff. Obviously, we could talk about your career for like six hours and that sort of thing. 
but I don't want to yep. take up too much of your time. So, um, yeah, uh, what about uh, what about this one? Um, who was your childhood hero? Brock Glover, all the way. That in the JT gear that he wore, he was always super clean. He rode really. He was just like just really fluid and smooth and i used to i used to go ride you know before you didn't have training videos like we have with elevate motocross Mm -hmm. right you didn't you didn't you couldn't just go on youtube or on your phone and watch you know instructional videos or watch your favorite guy ride you just literally looked looked at magazines and so i'd go on a magazine or look at magazines and i always just loved brock glover he rode yamaha i rode yamaha when i was little and all this and uh, i used to like fantasize about what it felt like on the bike like looking at a picture and then i would go ride someplace yeah. like oh i'm gonna do this or i'm gonna stick my foot out like this or and yeah. i would um you know uh yeah i would just yeah brock was my guy and now i i i tell the story all the time because it's so it's so relevant it, it's it's so important to me that you know i was a little boy watching you know looking at racers in magazines and every now and then we'd go to a pro race if there was something close and and like dreaming about being like like my heroes you know yeah and it's like all of those riders champions supercross champion motocross champions if you went through my contacts in my phone right now pretty much all those guys are numbers in my phone we could call them. I could text them hey what's up Brock because we're friends now mm. and if you had told the you know the 10 year old Jeff that stuttered really bad and just you know was the dorky little kid with you know chocolate and ice cream stuff you know gear didn't match you know riding a little dirt bike that one day that Brock Lever would be a friend of mine you know, I would say, no way, no way that's ever going to happen, you know, and mm. now we are equals that way. And some of those guys uh, uh, now I, I, I still, you know, there's a little kid inside me, you know, gets really giddy when, when I, we have Rick Johnson on the podcast or talk to David mm. Bailey, you know, sit down. We, I, I had, um, we, uh, after motocross of nations in France, it was probably eight, nine, ten years ago. After the race, we go to uh, we go to the airport Marriott at uh, in um, uh, you know in um, uh, Paris, and uh, so we're just trying to get some food before they close everything down. So we order some food. We're sitting in the lobby, and Brock just had me in stitches, man. He's just like, is so fun to talk to. You know what I mean? He's such a great personality, and like I said, it's like these guys are my friends now. And I just think like, how did I get here? You know, that's, that's, that's one of the things that um, has of all the hard work and sacrifice and dedication, everything I've had is um, to be equals with my heroes is really, you know, um, it's just a dream come true. Mm. Oh, man. I can say, uh, you know, I can certainly, yeah. Uh, um, I can resonate with that at least a little bit, you know, if, if, um, when I was a teenager, when I was at school, public speaking was the most terrifying thing I could possibly imagine. If I had to do a stand up report, I would have probably oh, not yeah. slept for two nights. Right. And nowadays I'm doing a podcast <laughs> and I love public speaking. And you couldn't get me off a karaoke stage if you if if I was there and all these sort of things. And I am um, I'm doing podcasts with Jeff Emig and Mickey Diamond. And, so what you're uh, saying we couldn't, we couldn't get you? Are you you're saying we couldn't get you on the karaoke stage? Or no, I couldn't get me off. off. You would you wouldn't get me off. Yeah. <laughs> so you what's your go to song? What can you do? Like no matter no matter how many oh. beers you've had, you can get you can knock it out. Um, I've got a few favourites. I've got a few. I actually closed out this show with a little bit of Kenny Rogers, so you'll get to hear a little bit of that. <laughs> um, but uh, oh, look, I um, my go-to used to be uh, a bit of bon, bon Jovi. Used to be probably my go-to. 
Um, that uh, Bon Jovi, a bit of um, a bit of Born to Be Wild, Steppenwolf. That was a, that was a, that was a very karaoke favourite. What else? Um, there was another one. Uh, oh, the yeah, uh, the, that was, song, that the was song from, easy. You... The song from Rocky <laughs> Three. You know what is it? The one from Rocky Three. Um, my you know, uh, survivor, I had the tiger. Survivor, I had the tiger. Yeah, that, that was a few of my favourites when I used to uh, when I was younger. Like I don't go out anymore, so I don't get a chance to do that. But when I was younger, we, uh, yeah, I used to uh, love a bit of that. Yeah, I haven't done it for a very long time, no. but I'm a guy that's always singing. Yeah, I haven't either. Sort of thing. I haven't either. And, uh, yeah, do you, what about you? You hit up the karaoke? No, not in a long time. But I, I, I you know, um, you know, um, I play guitar also. Uh, yeah. A little bit, not great, um, but I've got a, I pretty much like I can have quite a few adult beverages and still knock out every rose has its thorn. It's oh, not nice. good, not good. Yeah, yeah, we're not not winning any Grammys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It doesn't, have, it. it doesn't have to be good. It just has to. You, it just has to. You have fun. That's all. It's good fun. Yeah, a lot more. I went, um, went to a show. Went to a show in Nashville, uh, February fifteenth. Um, young friend of mine uh blake red and you might have seen him i posted some stuff he's a new he's a new country dude he's a, you know um former uh, motocross rider arena cross yep. rider and now he's got a career going in music so after he did his album release party in nashville and afterwards we're backstage and he's the one that has the jack daniels deal and all this so the people from jack daniels bring him a jack daniels uh, guitar and nice. i was pretty faded i had a few jack daniels that night um, so I'm trying to tune the thing up and then me and another guy, we get back and we, we start playing a couple songs and, and then one thing led to another, every rose has this thorn came out for a little bit and they're like, Oh my God, you guys are terrible. You had to stop. But we had a good time. <laughs> with it, so. Yeah. Yeah. As long as you, as long as you're having a good time, you know, like, yeah, uh, yeah, that's it. Yeah. What about while we're on music? Um, perfect segue. What if you had one album to listen to for the rest of your life, what are you going with? So I know that all everybody knows I'm Zeppelin like through and through, but if I got one album, one complete album, I'm probably going Frampton Comes Alive, two disc set, the live versions of uh, yeah. uh, Do You Feel Like We Do and Lines on My Face and all that are just, yeah. Cool. I was, been many I was nights expecting. Lake Havasu, we, we closed out the night on the boat totally faded with you know, the last song ends up being peter frampton so yeah. yeah i was expecting zeppelin four but anyway that, that's all right well yeah. zeppelin four would be short i would probably i would probably have to go with you know physical graffiti just because it's longer yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know okay yeah 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 i like to so, uh i like double to, album when i'm on a big uh, road trip i like to um get it, some of my favorite albums out and just play them because you don't you know, i'll just play them from start to finish you know and my last big road trip but i go yeah. but i go in spurts though like last week um i listened to red Farron all week like it's all i listen to it's a uh, seven six tracks maybe seven tracks it was just like on repeat i just get yeah. in the zone right um and then this week i've literally gone to you know, I've gone to Hank Williams Jr. and I'm just playing every Hank Williams Jr. track that I have, a bunch of just odd albums and a song here, an album there, whatever. And I've just been playing it. So that's kind of the mood. It's like the mood. I just stay in that mood. Yeah. Right. So I get what you mean. Yeah. If you like haven't I'll... been to a, if you haven't been to a Hank Williams Jr. show, I suggest you need to come up here to America and go to one. It's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I yeah, uh, I've only been to America once, man, and I'm but I plan, I definitely plan to go back, um, go back a lot. I reckon so. <laughs> it's just well, uh, it, no it, it, yeah, it, obviously it's uh, it's expensive, hey. So yeah, but now I, I actually this year was my first trip to America, so in January, so and that was that uh, was fantastic. Yeah, went to uh, went to Anaheim one. Um, Jeff, okay. when you watch when you watch a race. Um, you know, say um, say uh, Supercross Futures is a perfect example. When you watch that, what what is it about a rider that makes you a fan of them? Um, I'm looking for a kid that's 
that's um, performing well, but it doesn't look like he's at 100%. I think especially in the in the futures, you see that there's some kids that they're they're at their ceiling, right? This yep. is this is all they've got. Yeah. And so I guess not that I not that I don't enjoy somebody giving 100% effort and like laying it on the line to win. I certainly appreciate that, right? Um, but it's like you're kind of looking for who's who's making it look hard and who's making it look easy. And I think that like you take Jet Lawrence, for instance, once I first started watching him ride, he was a shift ath- athlete back in the day. We did a mm-hmm. dunes trip and stuff with Joe Shimoda and, and all this. It's like, wow, he's, he does it pretty easy. So you're wondering, okay, if he wins, was he at his ceiling or does he have more room to grow, right? And I think that it's pretty apparent there's certain certain riders that can win the regional Supercross championship here in America over the 30, 35 years that we've had that had that uh, championship, um, certain riders that are champions, but you realize that's they that's they don't have much past that. And mm. things came together, and they and they managed to win the title. But yep. are they going to be able to go on and and win a 450 main event or a 450 championship? Because once again, that's when things really escalate. Then mm. you know, it's like going from college football to pro football. Well, you guys don't have it necessarily down there, but you know, yeah, it's like yeah. So, um, um. So when I watch the kids with the futures riders, like like Drew Adams, this this kid who just won last week again, like when I watch him ride at the amateur level, the races that mm-hmm. we're at, I like what I'm seeing. There's certain yeah. kids that go win, but that's all they all they have. And so I guess you're you're just kind of looking for who's got who's doing it easy and who's making it look really difficult, because then that'll kind of tell you what they have next year or in the future you know yeah. and every now and then some guys surprise you you know there's been some riders that are the bull in the china shop and they outwork everybody but the problem is especially right now let's say the last 15 years or so of supercross there's a lot of guys doing the hard work in my days no there wasn't 15 doing the work right there wasn't 10 doing the work Mm. They thought they were doing the work, but they really weren't. Probably yep. less than that. Nowadays, yep. the guy that's getting 15th, he's putting in all the hard work. So hard work alone doesn't get it done. So now it's like, okay, if everybody's training at this level, where do you find the edge? Well, the motorcycle certainly is one part of it, and you're responsible for developing the motorcycle for you. But also is then you're going back to developing your technique and your style and, and how you move on the bike, which is all you. Mm. Nobody else can do that for you. You don't have a trainer that's that's going to be able to do that for you. And I think that that's where Jet's at right now. Is he's found a way um, <clears throat> to um, develop his technique to where he's very efficient on the bike. And so his ceiling, we don't know where his ceiling's at. It's unknown at this point. Mm. Right. That's right. Yeah, it is unknown, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. We might get to see it at Salt Lake City, maybe if he's got to do something, you know, magic from a bad start or something that uh, could uh, Man, could make. For I don't know. I don't story, want to be it? battling Cooper Webb at Salt Lake because no. Webb is such a he's uh, when the pressure's on, he 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 knows how to get it done. He's clutch. So yeah, they better hope that it's not down to you know a tide or a point or two going into the final race because my money would be on web. Yeah. I think anyone's would be on web. He is, uh, he is absolutely clutch. Um, Oh yeah. Yeah. Here's a, here's a fun one. Who was your teenage crush? So for me, for me, it was Kelly Bundy from, uh, from married with children. She was my teenage <laughs> crush. What about, what about yourself? Yeah. Teenage celebrity crush. Who was that for you? God, I don't even remember. I don't, I, Man, um, 
it's hard to say. What was the girl on the on the little high flyer and motocross cards? Fred Andrews' wife. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not sure who that yeah. was. Yeah, on the high flyers cards. Yeah. <laughs> I remember the high flyers cards. Yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> no, that's yeah, right. there was there was always. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if there was just one. <laughs> hey, you're probably the wrong person to ask about that. Huh? There was probably probably uh, probably enough girls hanging around you uh, that you didn't need to have a. Yeah, but crush. when you're like, <laughs> it it feels different than what it is now. Where when we were young guys coming into Supercross, the Coors girl or the camel supercross yeah girl they were they were a little more mature right and nowadays it's like it's like the monster energy girls the the you know the collection they were much younger but yeah, then again yeah, i'm way older so maybe i'm that <laughs> more the age yeah so my on my my running joke is you know i've got i've got a lot of younger friends you know and um and they'll uh talk about the monster girls and or whatever and i and my running thing is uh they're they're too close to the age of my daughter. I'm more interested in what the monster girl's mums look like. So that's it. Yeah, there you that's go. my uh, yeah. That's more uh, that's more my uh, my uh, my go is what what do the mums look like? Yeah, cool, cool. Um, and just your your um, I've seen you've posted a fair bit about We Big Gear. Do you want to tell us a bit about that? That's uh, obviously one of the new things what? that you uh, we um We Big Gear. Only no, what is it? We big, yeah, we, we big, big moto. Yeah. Well, we big moto. You would have, you would have seen Camel Smoker Cross and all these yes. crazy yeah, beer yeah. brands and and all this different stuff. So, we big was founded by um, a designer that was at Fox Racing for twenty five years. His name's Todd Covey, and yeah. Todd's uh, one of the greatest motocross gear designers in the world. Um, well respected by all the all the greatest designers out there, and. Um, so when I left Shift after 26 years, Fox and Shift, um, you know, had lots of great conversations with uh, all of the top brands that you can imagine. Um, Todd and I have been friends forever. And uh, I went down to the offices probably to pick up some hats or whatever, tees. And I said, hey, do you ever think about making a modern set of race wear? Because the previous race wear was like, 1985 fox chassis like the pant yeah was like a 1985 pant the jersey was kind of thick like not you know not a current race wear jersey and so we started talking about it well what if we did that and um we do it in the wee big way like that that only todd could do right mm. and so that first kit well technically the gear that i wore at uh, loretta's last year the jack daniels gear that was that the new chassis that we built that's your modern like all the right fabrics patterns yep. you know stretch blah 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 yep. fit. um and we didn't sell that that was just uh that was just for that race and then the first kit that we came out with um is what todd asked me we were bouncing some names off um uh, off each other on what we should name this gear, right? You, it's, it kind of looks like that, like 1992 Malcolm Smith, you know, JT Blend, like kind of. Mm. Um, so that that set of gear, uh, I ended, I said, well, what about Blaze of Glory? Just like Bon Jovi, you know, John Bon Jovi, <laughs> Blaze of Glory. There's nothing more 90s yeah. than that song yeah. and that that deal. And so, so that was the first kit that we released. Uh, we're releasing more kits soon. Um, we've got this week, we've got some new gear up with the Miller High Life um, branding mm. on it. So you'll be able to get a pant, uh, pant, uh, black pant jersey or white pant jersey in the Miller High Life. So we've added that to what we're calling the, the Wee Big Emig collection. So yeah. anything that's in the collection is going to be the, the technical build chassis uh, pant jersey that I'm wearing right now. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Cool, good to uh, good to see. I've seen some of the stuff. I like I like the t-shirt you got on right now. I like that sort of yeah. It's um, yeah, it's it's cool to see. Well, wait uh, to see what the next kit. We've got we've got two new kits coming out in a few weeks. Fire, fire. That's all I got to say. Be <laughs> right, I'm uh, I'm looking forward to it. Um, 
what 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 other interests so you you play the guitar you you know you um what other interests outside of dirt bikes that do you have i mean i ride mountain bikes quite a bit um uh, e-bikes with intense so i have intense uh, alloy s uh, yep. e-bike super fun um enjoy uh you know, obviously trying to spend some time with my kids before they don't want to spend any more time with me. Um, like did a couple of snowboard sessions with my son here late in the season, just two, two really great days. Um, my girlfriend, Jessica and I, uh, we, we have the dogs and we like to spend some time together. Uh, we don't get out hiking and stuff quite as much as we talk about as we'd like to, but yeah. doing that, um, do love to travel, you know, um, with my new deal with Mun Racing Husqvarna, uh, I'm gonna uh, get an FC 350 or not? It's not an FC. It's a 350 enduro bike and also uh, FE, a Jordan 901. Yeah. What's it? Or F? Now nah, FE or an FE? FE? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, FE. So four enduro. Yeah. So mm. that uh, also um, gonna get the adventure bike. So the Norden 901, which is just a badass adventure bike, right top of the mm. line. Uh, and Jessica and I are going to do more riding. She actually has a, a CRF uh, 125, so the trail 125, so she likes yep. to ride. So we're actually thinking about trying to get out on Sunday even um, to do a little bit of riding uh, that way. And just, you know, really, other than riding motocross, is I, this year I really want to expand my my riding into enduro type off-road adventure stuff um because i used to do a lot of that with my dad i mean my dad yeah hopefully i'll get a ride in with my dad here this year uh he still rides more than anybody i know he's 80 years old he's got a couple of different bikes and and um so hopefully whether it's with my dad or whether it's with jessica we can get out and do some more camping you know take the dogs out and just you know, spend more time in the outdoors, I think is probably uh, one of the goals that I'd like to achieve this year. And, and of course, creating video content and creating some, you know, some aspirational video content around that, right? Mm. To, you know, I kind of feel like that that's where my job is, is to encourage people to ride motorcycles and dirt bikes and to participate in the sport that we both love so much. Um, and uh, if, if I can encourage people to do that um, that way and inspire them, then I, I will have done my job. Absolutely. It's the uh, best sport in the world, huh? Right? That's for sure. That's for sure. It can be. It can be brutal at times, but yeah. It, it can be. It can be. Like it, and... it, it, has a, uh, it has some uh, has some bad times, that's for sure. But it's, uh, yeah. it's all worth it, isn't it? Otherwise, we wouldn't do it. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just two more things, man. Um, give me your best Aussie accent. Oh shit! I, I don't think it's that good. I don't know. <laughs> no, I, I'm not spent a, a lot of time around Michael Byrne, right? Uh, and and Chad Reed at times, and some of these guys. So, man, um, the the best the best thing was the best my best my my favorite Aussie accent is hearing Chad Reed trying to say James Stewart's nickname, which is Bubba. This is it's like Bubber. It's not where there's no A on the end. Chad says Bubba. <laughs> yeah, Bubba. Bubba. It's not <laughs> yeah, like it doesn't quite right. come out. It's not Bubba. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. Bubber. So. Bubber. <laughs> yeah, that's uh that, that's it. Give us give us a good just give us like a good eye, mate. Oh good eye, mate. You're not what, too bad. What 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 region would that accent be from? Ah, look! Oh, that's what funny thing about Aussies is. Um, I don't know. Sometimes people think there's difference. I, I don't sort of find too much difference across the country, apart from um, people from Adelaide are a little bit different. They got a bit of a different sort of um, a little. They're a little bit sort of proper, a little bit more English in some of their pronunciation. Yeah. People from Adelaide, but other than that, like I don't know people from Tasmania and people from Darwin, and I reckon we all sound pretty similar. That, the guys really? up in Dar Darwin, Darwin, and, Darwin and North Queensland and that, they have a couple of, I don't think their voice is that different. They do things where they put like, they put like A, A, what do you reckon? A on the, on the end of their, on the end of their yeah. sentences and yeah. things. But 
Yeah, I think probably more so that um, the uh, I think the more out in the country you are, the more broader your accent gets, no matter what part of the country it is. You yeah. know, when you're away yeah. from the city, because um, I'm a country boy, my accent's fairly broad. You know, I think that's um, sort of it. yeah, different to the yeah. states. You know, where like um, a New York accent's way different to a Texan accent and and so on and oh, yeah. you know minnesota oh, even sure. minnesota accents different and all that sort of thing which which we notice you know oh, yeah. up there, you get up there in the central part of america in the north and and uh yeah they definitely have that the uh they say a about everything oh riding some motocross eh? And it's like yeah. you wonder what what part of europe did that come from yeah so. <laughs> yeah yeah nice Cool, cool. All, All right. right, yeah. Um, I'm uh, I'm just going to uh, slip into a little bit of Kenny Rogers, man. Uh, there's just a funny story behind it. It's nothing serious. Um, and um, I always say to people, if you want to join in and you know the words, then by all means. But there's never any, uh, never any pressure. All right. So I handed him my bottle, and he drank down my last swallow. Then he bummed a cigarette <laughs> and asked me for a light. And the night got deathly quiet. And his face lost all expression. Said, if you're going to play the game, boy, you got to learn to play it right. Play you got right. no way to hold him. <laughs> no way no to, when fold to fold him. No way to walk away. No way to run. You never count your money. When you're sitting at the table, there'll be time enough for counting. When the dealing's done. Dealing's done. All right. Nice. Thank you, Jeff. Well, really I, appreciate your time. When I come down time. to Australia, we're going to have to get together and hit, hit up some karaoke, all right? Absolutely, man. That sounds fantastic. All right. Thank you very much for your time today. And good luck at Loretta's. Yeah, you bet, Steve. Yeah, thanks, thanks, uh, thanks for having me on. I appreciate everybody listening. I know we've gone it's about an hour and a half here, so uh, yeah. hopefully uh, – it was entertaining for you. Got some insight and had a good time with it. And if you're on a long drive, it have, helps you pass some time and some miles. All right. Absolutely. Thank you, man. All right. Cheers. Cheers, Steve. All right. All right. Bye. bye.